When many people think of the saints, they think of pious, soft-spoken people that spent most of their time in the chapel and lived safe, boring lives. What they don't think of are people who spent years in slavery after being captured by pirates, won their freedom by converting their master, found loopholes in church law to give new roles to women, and who were described by their friends as having a big temper. And yet, this is the story of St. Vincent de Paul, one of the most charitable men to ever live and whose legacy continues to thrive in the life of the church today. Who was this saint and why should you know him? This is Catholicism in Focus. Each year, many men join the priesthood because of a higher calling. They wish to renounce the way of the world for the way of God, serving at the altar and in the community as a sign of Christ on earth. Vincent. He joined for fame and wealth. Born in 1581 to a poor peasant family, there were few opportunities available for a better life. He joined the priesthood young, becoming ordained at the age of 24, and spent much of his early years mingling with the rich and powerful in hopes of attaining wealth for himself. In 1605, in pursuit of just that, he was traveling home to receive a small legacy left to him when his ship was overtaken by pirates. He was kidnapped, brought to Tunisia, and sold to a family of Muslims that tried to teach him their faith. As it turns out, the head of the household was an apostate Christian. One of his wives was interested in learning about her husband's former religion, and so asked Vincent to sing hymns to her and teach her about his God. She was so compelled by Vincent's testimony that she convinced her husband to return to his faith. The man eventually traveled to France with Vincent, where he confessed, rejected Islam, and entered an order of brothers to serve the poor. Vincent was set free, and the notoriety of the situation offered him prestigious posts among the nobility as a spiritual director. It appeared that Vincent had everything he wanted in life. Fame, wealth, respect, and society. But God was up to something that was about to change everything. In 1617, he was sent to hear the confession of a peasant near death. Vincent was shocked to learn how poorly catechized this man was, and soon found that many of the poor had been neglected spiritual care. Something radically needed to change, and Vincent believed he was the one to do it. What came of it was the Congregation of Missions, known today as the Vincentians. Leaving his comfy positions among the rich, Vincent left everything to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and set out with two goals, to serve the poor in both body and spirit, and to train additional priests to take up this mission. Given the immense need, it took no time for the movement to take off. Within Vincent's own lifetime, houses were adopted all over France, Italy, Tunisia, Algiers, Ireland, Madagascar, and Poland. Men from all over were inspired by his life and wanted to serve the poor. Since then, the Vincentians have become known for their tremendous work in alleviating poverty and comforting the sick, works that our world desperately need. And yet, this is not the primary focus of it all. If we're to truly understand Vincent, we have to remember why he was converted to this mission in the first place. It was the state of the poor man's soul that drove him. Thus, in regards to the poor, he wrote to the brothers, You are not to attend to their bodies solely you are to also help them to save their souls. Above all, urge them to make general confessions, bear patiently with their little fits of bad temper, encourage them to suffer patiently for the love of God. Do not get angry with them and never speak to them harshly. Weep with them. God made you their consolers. The body is important and alleviating suffering critical, but neither of these things matter if you neglect the salvation of their soul. A task that is not the work of priests alone. While priests are obviously essential to the sacramental life of the church, he understood that it did not take a member of the clergy to feed the poor and catechize them. Any trained layperson could do this. And so he trained them. With the help of St. Louise de Mirillac, Vincent formed two confraternities of laypeople. Women who would visit the sick and poor families, find out what they needed, and organize the community to provide for them, and men who would find jobs for the poor and catechize them. Before long, every town and parish, it seemed, had a confraternity of people working for the poor. But even this wasn't enough. As helpful as volunteer laypeople were in this regard, Vincent was interested in women who could devote themselves entirely to the mission. He wanted a congregation of consecrated religious women dedicated to the poor. Today, there are hundreds of congregations like this, but in his time, this was unheard of. There were no religious sisters working in schools or orphanages because all consecrated women were bound to the cloister. They were not allowed to roam freely or to have independence. Luckily for Vincent, he was a crafty canon lawyer who knew that there is always a way around the rules. Instead of being consecrated by making public vows, like all other orders and congregations at the time, Vincent convinced a few women, led by Louise, to take private vows, consecrated themselves to God and to each other without receiving the recognition or oversight of the church. He wrote of the sisters, They should consider that although they do not belong to a religious order, that state not being compatible with the duties of their vocation, 
Yet, as they are much more exposed to the world than nuns, their monastery being generally no other than the abode of the sick, their cell a hired room, their chapel the parish church, their cloister the public streets or the wards of the hospitals, they are obliged on this account to lead as virtuous a life as if they were professed in a religious order, to conduct themselves wherever they mingle with the world with as much recollection, purity of heart and body, detachment from creatures, and to give as much edification as nuns in the seclusion of their monasteries. Basically, you're a nun in your heart, even if the church doesn't officially recognize it. And so for the first time ever, women were sent out to do missionary work. They were in the streets and welcoming people into their homes, serving the poor and sick, caring for not only their bodies, but their souls. Today, they exist as one of the largest congregations of women, numbering more than 18,000, even if they are technically not nuns. So to recap, that's a men's community of priests numbering in thousands, confraternities of lay people numbering in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands, and a congregation of women at 18,000. This must have been the kindest, most patient, saintly person you've ever heard of, right? Well, son of the time. Despite his great works, Vincent was known to have a bit of a temper and difficult to work with at times. In his own words, he writes that if it were not for divine grace, he would have been in temper hard and repellent, rough and crabbed. But all saints say this, right? Their sins are the worst of all, according to them. And so we should probably take this with a grain of salt. That being said, even his friends had something to say. In one account, a contemporary said that he was known by nature of a bilious temperament and very subject to anger. In case you're not familiar with that word, bilious means causing nausea or vomiting. The people closest to him said that his demeanor could make you sick. Yikes. But what a great testament. One that I think only endears us to him more. Here was a man who was born into poverty and so, understandably, wanted to be rich. Here was a man who was sold into slavery and suffered greatly, so understandably, had some anger issues. But he didn't let these things define him. He looked outside of himself to the needs of the world and sought the grace of God to be what the world needed. He didn't try to save the world himself, but turned to Christ, the only Savior, and organized those around him to work together for God. Today, his spirit lives on in hundreds of thousands of people, not because he had worldly ambitions or issues with anger, but because he was humble enough to ask for help when he knew that he wasn't enough. Alone, we can do little, but as Vincent shows us, together, we can make the kingdom of heaven present here on earth. Thank you.